using technology to promote play and leisure among people, people with disabilities. Uh, my name is Noa Nitsan. I'm an occupational therapist and the, to show us at the Arcana, which is very unique and interesting accessible music uh, instrument. So let's start. A few words about Beth Easy Shapiro. Uh, Beth Easy Shapiro, it's an NGO and is one of the leading organization in Israel in the field of disabilities. With four decades of experience with people with a wide range of disabilities and across multiple cultures, we are impacting half a million people each year and we work globally and have also a special consultant status at the UN. We have few units at Beth Easy and you will see today example from our educational framework. We have a uh, early intervention center for Hebrew and Arabic speakers and also special education school. <clears throat> and in our technology center, we are focusing on implementation, share our knowledge through blog conferences and webinars. And also we're working with developers, which is something very important for us as educators and, uh, and therapists that work in the field. So we can really influence in a wide pers perspective. And I think that this is a very good picture to start this session about play. Uh, you can see here in the picture, one of our students playing uh, Taki, it's the Israeli version of Uno using a very low tech solution, uh, a card holder because he cannot use his hands and also very high tech solution, a computer with an eye gaze system so he can communicate with his friends while he's playing. Um, and I think this is, um, and his smiles is, is everything. And why we are talking about play and leisure? Um, because play is critical for child development, which is very obvious. And leisure has important significance for quality of life, which is also very obvious. But, but what, what we often see on the field, field is that play is sometimes a means of advancing skills and rehabilitation versus play for the sake of play. There is not enough awareness among developers of games and toys for accessibility and inclusive design. And there is not enough resources and funding for play and leisure activities for children and adults with disabilities. And we are working according to the ICF model. And one of the main principles there is participation. And if we think about participation, we have to think about play and leisure, especially if we want to emphasize the ability of a person and not his disability. And here are a few things that we are doing in the field of play and leisure. So like I said, we are sharing knowledge and we are a part of um, in Israel and out Israel uh, networking. So you can see a few examples of organization or project that are in those, this field that we are um, taking part of. We also uh, share, our, uh, share our experience with in, uh, international conferences and took part in the Ludit as Pedro is going to mention. Uh, D4CR is a very um, important initiative about designing for children's rights, not just about children with disability, but they talk a lot about inclusion. And of course, the International Play Association. And we're working with developers. So we are, it's very important for us to raise the awareness for inclusive design. And we can do, we do it uh, with uh, lectures to companies like game companies or working with students. So that we have a lot of projects with design students, for example. And many times it's about games and um, it's very important to work with students in that stage when they're still young. And we see it after that they really, uh, it's very ex important expo exposure for them to this field. Um, we have at Bet Easy, uh, we have Park Haverim, which is the Frenchy Park. Um, it was actually the first accessible playground in Israel. It's inside a, a regular park in a very big uh, city in Israel. And we were the, the first one. And since then we share our, mo no, uh, share our model in, with other cities in Israel and outside Israel. And two weeks from now, we're celebrating Purim which is the most uh, playful and fun uh, Jewish holiday where everybody's getting with their costumes. And we're doing each year this project with design students from HAT uh, while they're designing um, um, costumes also to the wheelchair and the walker so the costume could be so beautiful. 
And why are we using technology? We are not using just technology for play and leisure, but for many children and adults, technology make play and leisure much more accessible and stimulate the motivation. And it's also very important that it's normative and age appropriate. And we are looking for, when, when we use technology, we are looking for um, things like playful and fun. It's not obvious because sometimes it's very um, like educational more uh, stuff, but we want them to be playful. It's very important that it will be age appropriate. So if you're working with a 10 years old child, I will choose something that is age appropriate. I will never choose a very childish app. And of course, if I'm working with adults, we always love to use mainstream stuff. So it will be easier to use. The children will feel much more comfortable. The family it will be easy to find. It will be much more affordable. We're thinking about inclusive design, like games that are for children with and without disabilities. And we always want to encourage the social interaction. And here are a few examples. First of all, we are starting from very young age. Uh, so we can see here in the picture those two little girls. On the left, um, one girl, she's playing with a doll with her therapist. And she's using her, an, an eye gaze system. And it's very important to remember when you're playing with a child it's to, to let him have a, a device so he can communicate. In the other picture, you see um, Ronnie is playing on an iPad because if she wants to play with a doll, an imaginary uh, play, something that's very hard to make accessible, uh, she cannot play by herself. But when she's playing on an iPad and it's Toka Kitchen, it's very mainstream app, she can be independent. Sometimes we are using uh, external adaptation like here. Uh, it's external switches. So um, this child, he's using his head, his head movement to play on the iPad. It's Help Kids Learn app, actually. And like I said, we always want to encourage the children to play together. Sometimes people think that if you play on the screen, you're play by yourself, but not. It depends how we, the adults, bring the game to the children. So um, you can see on the left, they're playing together on an iPad on adjust adjusted uh, height uh, stand on the wall or playing on the big touch screen or even with the, uh, with the eye gaze. So this child is playing on the, with the eye gaze system, but his friends are not, but still they come to play with him because they have such a cool games on his computer. And this is an example from actually the first lockdown in Israel. So when the COVID came, we, we start to think about solution for not just for education, for therapists, and we have this uh, YouTube channel and we upload uh, videos for the children and the parents and we hear from them that really need um, um, things to, to, to play at home. So for example, uh, we did a Zoom bingo with all the staff and the students. And also we show them how they can play Funny Faces, which is a card game. But we show them you can play it also with an iPad and see, you can play it also with your friends while you're at home. We have it but easy, the easy senses, the multi-sensory therapeutic environment. And this is a great environment to encourage play. And here in the picture, you see that we're using the interactive floor, which is some kind of uh, virtual reality environment while each movement uh, influences the whole environment. So it's, and there are many games in this platform. So we use it a lot for play. And like I said before, we, we of course, it's also about leisure. <clears throat> so we do it for art, like uh, painting, uh, like playing on Arca in the Arcana, like Chaim is going to show us at the end. Uh, we have amazing uh, photography club in school and also sport uh, like boccia, which is a special Olympic sport. And this is my last example. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in the field of innovation is developing apps and we do it with volunteers from uh, SAP labs in Israel. And one of those apps are Easy Dice, which is a virtual dice. And it's initially it was for children that cannot use a physical dice. But at the end, because you can really do a full customization and put whatever picture you want on the dice, so it became a very playful game. So we use it a lot for play. So uh, you can uh, download this, this app on all our other apps. They're all free uh, on the App Store. And I will summarize now and say that um, play and leisure are important at any age. 
and technology offers many solutions for play and leisure. Uh, technology does not replace every activity, but can really provide solution for participation. But more attention and resources are needed, and we need to continue to raise to awareness for the need of inclusive design. Um, that's it, thank you. Uh, here is my and Sharon email address. Please, you can write an uh, email to us. And this is our blog. You can visit our blog, it's Hebrew, English, and Arabic. And there's a lot of information about uh, technology, assistive technology, etc. Okay, stop sharing now. Okay, and we continue now to Pedro. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Pedro Encarnação and I would like to briefly talk about play for children with disabilities. In seven minutes, I would like to introduce you to the Ludi Cost Action and address what is play, children with disabilities and play, barriers to play, toys, games and, games and play spaces, and the role of robotics in play. Ludi was a cost action active between 2014 and 2018, shared by Professor Serenella Vesio from the University of Bergamo. It was a pan-European network involving a truly multidisciplinary team of more than 100 persons from 32 European countries. In Ludi, Play for Children with Disabilities was at the center of all activities, with all the different disciplines contributing with their perspectives to the topic. We aimed at collecting, systematizing existing knowledge, developing new knowledge, and disseminating the best practices with the overall goal of spreading awareness on the importance of giving children with disabilities the opportunity to play. But what is play? In many publications, we see play defined as what we acknowledge as play. But without a definition, how can we develop the scientific area? How can we compare different studies if they do not share a common definition of play? In Ludi, we adopted the definition by Garvey. Play is a range of voluntary, intrinsically motivated activities associated with recreational pleasure and enjoyment. Main characteristics of play include free choice, process-oriented with no other goal than the pleasure of play, active engagement, among others. We should have clear in our minds the difference between play-like activities, activities that use play to achieve therapeutic or educational goals, and play for the sake of play, with the characteristics mentioned before. Play is not a waste of time. It is important for children's well-being, and even without being controlled by an adult, it is instrumental for child development. And play deprivation has been associated to anxiety, frustration and passivity, decreased sense of self-efficacy, decreased self-confidence, decreased satisfaction, and play deprivation ultimately leads to learned helplessness. But do children with disabilities play? Well, children with disabilities are, first of all, children. For children with disabilities, besides the contribution for their well-being and development, play can also provide opportunities for inclusion. All children need, want, and can play. And you know what? Play is a right enshrined in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child in its Article 31, and in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in its Article 30. However, children face many barriers to play, including lack of recognition of importance of play and safe hazards environments, resistance to children's use of public space, balancing risk and safety, lack of access to nature, and the list goes on. Pressure for educational achievement, overly structured schedules for children, neglect of Article 31 in development programs, lack of investment in cultural and artistic opportunities, growing role of electronic media, commercialization of play. We all know that children use toys and games to play and that they play in different spaces. When, think of, when thinking about children with disabilities, the issue of the accessibility of toys, games, and play spaces comes into play. 
should they all be 100% accessible? We should keep in mind that play occurs in the teen border between boredom and frustration. Too much challenge, too much challenge leads to frustration. Too little challenge leads to boredom. Toys, games, play spaces should be chosen according to the capacities and interests of the play participants in order to enable them to experience playfulness. The play value comes from providing opportunities that children can access and use and wish to use. They should provide the just right amount of challenge and probably they won't be 100% accessible. Especially if you think about play as an opportunity for children with disabilities to interact with typically developing children. You need toys, games, and play spaces that offer the just right amount of challenge for all. Is there a role for robotics in play? Robots can perceive and act upon the environment. They are able to take decisions. With robotics, toys can come alive. Robots can attract attention, keep the child engaged, adapt to the child, providing always the just right amount of challenge. In my research, I have been using robots as integrated augmentative manipulation and communication tools to enable children with disabilities to participate in play and academic activities. By controlling the Lego Mindstorms robot through their communication device, children are able to manipulate objects and perform the same activities as their typically developing peers. In conclusion, I would like you to keep in mind that play characteristics include being a child-led activity, freely chosen, with no other goals besides the fun of playing. Play-like activities with therapeutic and educational goals are very important, but do not substitute play for the sake of play. Play is a right for all children. Toys, games, and play spaces need to provide the just right amount of challenge. We need to strive for a new culture of play for all for society that recognizes the importance of play for the sake of play for all. In Ludi, we did in fact collect, systematize, and disseminate best practices by different means. One of them was the publication of several books, and you have information on those books in the Ludi webpage. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pedro. Um, it is great that now on the Ludi website, uh, you can find a lot of resources, great resources. Uh, it's very easy to find it uh, on the website and there are uh, books and articles and tools of assessment. Uh, so now we're going to hear uh, uh, Mr. Yovan Galitsky from Microsoft. Share your screen. Okay, can you see my screen? Okay, hey, uh, hi everyone, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you, thank you now for inviting me here to uh, talk. So uh, my name is Yaron Galitsky and I'm uh, working in Microsoft, kind of spending the time between uh, Seattle and Israel. And I will cover in the next few minutes uh, our journey around the Xbox Adaptive Controller. So um, I spent until recently more than 10 years in Xbox uh, working on all of the hardware devices from uh, Kinect, accessories, consoles. And I like what Pedro said about gaming. Uh, it's not a waste of time. And yes, it's not a waste of time at any age. And I think everyone recognizes gaming today, it's become more and more important. There are more than 2 billion gamers around the world. It's important in just gaming on, you know, time, but it's also important for social and you can see that in education, you can see just everywhere. So gaming is important. And I am fortunate to work in, in a company that the mission is, uh, the, the mission of the company is empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And this is everyone in every context. And now I talk about the technology, computers, internet, providing today, uh, changing the world, I think that's clear, and providing the opportunity to access uh, for employment, for education, for social, 
And again, working coming from a technology company, it's not just fortunate to work there, it's also our responsibility to make it happen and to provide equal opportunities for, for everyone. So let's talk about gaming. So this is the Xbox uh, gamepad, the Xbox controller uh, that I work on for many, many years. And over like 15 years, it's, it's the best controller in the world. And we shape it, you know, we just try to make it uh, every time a little bit uh, better and better. However, uh, this best controller in the world has some assumptions which are barrier to some uh, gamers. The assumption that you can hold it with two hands, uh, you can you know, reach simultaneously to different buttons, you, can, uh, you have actually the, uh, the ability to hold it over time. And as I said, this is again, this is a barrier, this hidden assumption are barriers for some gamers. And what we've seen over the years that gamers who want to play had to hack the controller, actually break it apart and use different hacks in order to, uh, to adapt it, to adjust it to their needs. And the problem with these systems is first, not everyone can do. Uh, you can see some, some pictures here from different charities in, in U, UK and US. In order to do that, there are some charities that um, if you knew about these charities, you had a, like a long, long wait list. And then when you get to your turn, you get a very expensive system, not stable, hardware not stable, software not stable, very hard to maintain. So there were some solutions there, but they were not like a stable and a um, uh, solution, sustained solutions. And definitely, I think someone say about the smile, you can see the smile of, uh, you know, the smile of the kids playing. So a little bit of our journey, and I will go quickly uh, over time. We started with uh, the Elite controller, then we moved to Copilot and then to Adaptive Controller. And I, I will go through this uh, journey now. <clears throat> so um, in 2015, we launched the Xbox Elite controller, which was designed for, for, for professional gamers. It was really designed for the top 1% gamers in the world. You can, you can do a lot of configuration. You can change thumbstick, the, the grip, the material were like uh, uh, um, suitable for a long time of, of gaming. But then we had a very uh, positive surprise and we didn't plan for that. We start to see feedback from the community that it's basically this controller for professional gamers help gamers with disability to start to play. And then because of the configuration and ability to adjust, uh, gamers could play with one hand. They can play with different uh, thumbsticks. So very interesting example of where you design for one purpose and then it's, you can scale it to other, uh, other gamers. The next one is co-pilot. Usually when you are I'm, um, playing or with a character, you have a controller and you control one character in the game. And then we came with this approach of co-pilot, but when you can have two controllers to control the same character and think about it for many, many use cases. Uh, the simple one is you can play with someone, let's say that you have uh, limited mobility and you can just uh, you know, press one button. So you can just shoot and your partner is just moving around and you're shooting. It also allow gamers, again, with limited mobility to play with two controllers, one controller on one end, the other controller under your chin. So this was, a, again, a softer change that uh, made a lot of progress in, in um, giving accessibility to, uh, to gaming. And then we moved to the adaptive controller, which was from the get-go, was all about inclusive, all about accessibility and inclusive design. And when you look at the picture, uh, when I ask people, hey, what do you see here? What the first thing that you see here? The answer is it's a family. It's a family of devices. There is no, you don't see like different from the design language between the console, the controller and the adaptive controller, which is on the, on, on the bottom or the right end. And when you look about, and I will touch a little bit about inclusive design, a lot of research, and I think maybe it's obvious today, uh, gamers, they don't want to have a, 
a device that looks like it came from an hospital environment. They want exactly the same coolness, the same language of Xbox family. And that's super important to you. It's, it's part of the Xbox uh, family of devices. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, the controller at, at a very, very high level, and I'll show example in a second. It's taking your regular Xbox, I, I have it here, like the regular Xbox controller and externalize all of the buttons. There are 19 buttons. They externalize uh, using a 3.5 millimeter jack that you can see here at, 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 the, at the side of the controller. And when we look at the design with few principles, first, it should be uh, discoverable. And I told you before, you know, gamers that had to uh, find it before, they need to find with charity, someone that can help them. This is the power of a company like Microsoft that, you know, with the marketing and channels, it's much more discoverable. The second was affordable. It should be affordable from price point perspective. If you look at the buttons here, they're like big black buttons here. All of the faces, the ability to, uh, to control your um, uh, uh, controller, even if you want on the device itself. If you go outside, these buttons could be $50, $60 per button. The entire controller is a $99. And affordability was uh, super important, keeping the cost very, very low. And the other one, it's about adaptive. It's about easy to set up. You know, many of the users, end users, they cannot set up themselves uh, the, the controller. So easy to set up is here. And I'm not sure I have enough time to go through all of the items here, which are easy to set up. Um, and then adaptive, what is adaptive? Adaptive is about adaptive the controller to the environment and the setup of the user. So the user in the center and make sure that it's not the user that need to adapt themselves to the controller. It's a controller, the ability to, for the controller to adapt uh, to the user. And these are a few examples few examples of uh, people actually using the adaptive controller. And you can see uh, the ability to externalize the buttons and locate them in, uh, in the setup of the, that fit for the specific need of the specific user. You can see the buttons, uh, you can see joystick, you can see in the middle that there is a button close to, uh, to the head. Uh, you can see users just in leisure. You can see use, usage in rehabilitation. Also interesting to see some picture recently from, you know, you can, you can recognize COVID-19 um, where, where I, you know, I'm working with some of the hospital in Israel and they asked me, hey, we have a, we have a department of kids that are using our respiratory systems and they cannot come to the hospital anymore. So they asked me to go and help um, set up adaptive controller in their homes. Let's, uh, and the other principle was, we don't want to create a, a platform, a system that uh, other people need to go and invent again the ecosystem. So we, we have done research about the ecosystem and majority, like more than 95% of the accessories out of the switches uh, or control using the 3.5 millimeter jack or USB. So you can see that, and we are working with other third party companies. So anyone that already have uh, these accessories can use it with uh, the adaptive controller. And you can see just regular buttons, joystick, uh, puff and, and sip, which is the ability to control using your uh, mouth with um, puff and sip. You can see a switch for like a gas paddle, light switch, when the light switch is, you need to have less than like 10X less power. So anything that can be in the ecosystem, anything that exists out there and anything that, you know, people can develop to, um, to a platform. Um, I'll just show that we went all the way even to packaging, to the design of the packaging that people again with, you can open the full packaging with a one finger I'll try the animation, hopefully it's uh, going. And it's, again, everything with loops, with one finger. And this is an example of a design that was starting here. And now we are taking almost to, uh, add, we are taking to other products, not just in gaming, any other products that we have uh, out there.
And just let's, uh, I want to uh, end it with uh, a phrase that I really, really believe in. When you do not intentionally, deliberately include, you will unintentionally include, exclude. And this is, again, this is all about inclusive design, making sure your team that develop a product, it's a diverse team. We, I forgot to say that, but we work with the community. We didn't try to just develop it like in isolation. We brought people, uh, gamers with different type of disabilities to develop it together with a very diverse team. And it's all about inclusive design. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much. It's not the first time that I hear your, this, this story and each time it's really amazing. It's all the, what's behind the story and how you and the agenda and it's really amazing. Thank you so much. If we will have time at the end, we're going to share with you um, a video of the um, controller. If not, we'll send you the link. And now we're moving to Ms. Nadine Ferris. So you can share your screen now. Thank you, Noah. Oh, bear with me. Apologies. Okay. Hopefully everyone can see that. Thank you, Yaron. That was fascinating and really great for me to see the controller up close, which is really wonderful. Um, so it's a real privilege to be involved today in the panel um, event. And I'm going to briefly go through a range of resources that inclusive technology offer. Um, that basically are used, assistive technology that is used to facilitate and enable play. So for those of you that aren't aware, um, inclusive technology was formed over 20 years ago and we were founded by um, three special educational needs teachers. We are really proud to be specialists in supporting children and adults with complex needs. And we feel as a team, and we work very hard to understand the importance of engaging an individual so that they feel motivated to participate in activities. Because something we've come across over the years is you can have lots of different assistive technology, but if a user isn't engaged to actually um, have a go at using that technology or participate in, in an activity, it's fairly pointless. Um, so that's something we always try to keep in mind when we're developing different resources. We're passionate about enabling users of resources to have fun. Ultimately, play should be fun. And that's really important. As Noah mentioned, it's extremely important in somebody's development. Um, and that's something that we strive for our resources to achieve. We have an awareness and understanding that many individuals with complex needs do not have the same opportunities as their peers to experience play due to their physical and cognitive difficulties. So the range of technology we offer is um, hardware devices from many amazing companies all over the world. Um, and that gives somebody their access to something. And we have an internal development team that um, develop software and apps for iOS um, that again are accessible and provide those opportunities to play alongside their siblings, their friends, and different people of, of different needs. The challenge for us all the way is to motivate a user to engage, and our resources enable an individual to access and enjoy play alongside others. I'm now going to show you a range of um, different videos to give you a quick overview of um, those resources that I feel closely relate to play as a, as a topic that we're looking at. The first video will give you an overview of Help Kids Learn, which is an online website that we developed, which offers over 100 games and activities. You can access those through many different methods. So just as we've seen switches, joysticks, touchscreens, 
rollerballs and eye trackers. Um, it's really great for users of any sort of physical age, but somebody that is um, at a pre-literacy or early literacy level. The next um, product I wanted to show you was Cosmo. This is a brand new product we've taken on very recently within our range, um, developed by a company called Felicia. And it's an award-winning interactive therapy and inclusive training system designed to help train motor skills, turn-taking, communication and more. So it's really um, fantastic in the variety that it offers the user. The next resource is the eye gaze learning curve. And it's one specific activity that I wanted to show you from the exploring and playing program. Within that title, we have 18 different games that provide exploring opportunities. But the key thing to mention is you can have different two users taking turns and playing together. And in the clip I'll show you, there are two young boys toys. So these are regular toys that be made um, switch accessible, basically. Right. My internet connection is playing up. So wave at me if there's a problem. So here is um, Help Kids Learn. As I mentioned, the next resource is Cosmo. Hi, my name is Dan and this is Cosmo. Cosmo is an exciting new system for creative learning and therapy, which works really well in SEN settings and also early year settings. Cosmo is made up of two parts. The first part are these wireless smart buttons, which are very sturdy and also very sensitive to touch. The second part is the Cosmo app, which allows you to connect your Cosmoids to your iPad. The app contains lots of activities that we've designed with professionals in special education and occupational therapy. And all of these activities focus on a variety of skills, such as cognitive skills, communication skills, and motor skills. You can use it in physical education, in memory and turn-taking games, uh, in music making or in sensory rooms. So it's a really versatile tool. You can teach colours, various notions, as well as motivating learners to vocalise more and to uh, collaborate and work as a team. Cosmo is really easy to use, really versatile and also very easy to customise. So if you'd like more information on how Cosmo can work for you, then take a look at the activities page on the website. Okay, and as I mentioned, um, this is a, a really short clip from Exploring and Playing, and it's the playground activity. I wonder if he likes the slide. Robot, baby. <laughs> right, whose turn is it now? <laughs> yep, cat's turn. <laughs> I think you like that, didn't you? <laughs> and finally, a couple of examples of different switch accessible toys. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>
Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, it's been a pleasure to present to you. And I will hand back to Noah. Wow, thank you so much. Um, I think that uh, if there's something I would like to take from your presentation, it's really the design of the games. I mean, it's, like I said at the beginning, it's great. That it's so accessible and you can use it in so uh, many ways, but the design is so important and that's why we love your, the game so much. They are so fun for, and, and they're fun and they're uh, with a lot of humor and it's great. Um, okay, so like I said, last but not least, uh, Chaim, Mr. Chaim Kairi, let's uh, see and hear our Kanak. Hello everybody. Uh, it's an honor to be on this panel uh, with amazing, uh, I actually find it uh, very interesting that uh, in English, the word play is also used uh, for music instruments, not only for uh, playing games, but uh, playing music instruments. And I think there, there are a lot of things in common um, from uh, Pedro's presentation. Uh, he mentioned the balance between uh, frustration and challenge. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, playing uh, an instrument is uh, uh, it's a very complex uh, activity. Um, most music teachers do not teach guitar under the age of 10 because of the painful blisters and uh, it's very difficult to play. So uh, we generally want to eliminate as much frustration as possible, but uh, keep it uh, challenging uh, so uh, to avoid boredom. Uh, so uh, my name is Haim, as I said, uh, from... Uh, uh, Arcana Instruments. Um, about uh, four years ago, uh, a 12 year old girl named Gil uh, came to a music teacher and uh, she wanted, she asked him to uh, teach her guitar. It sounds like a very simple uh, daily event that happens probably tens of thousands of times around the world. But uh, this was a special moment because uh, Gil, this girl, uh, she has cerebral palsy with uh, very limited movement uh, in her hands and fingers. And uh, Boaz, the guitar teacher, looked at her, at her, at her hand movement and, uh, and he knew that uh, this girl, unfortunately, cannot play guitar. It's very, guitar playing is very complex. Uh, but he noticed that uh, Gil has, uh, she's extremely motivated and uh, talented and bright. And he really wanted to uh, teach, girl, teach Gil uh, to play music, uh, even if it's not a guitar. Uh, so he looked around for instruments that are designed for people with disabilities. And unfortunately, he couldn't find a real musical instrument. Uh, he found all kinds of uh, instruments for infants and young children, just like uh, rattles that you shake uh, or uh, apps that you can just uh, play around with and they give you a, a musical experience, but they don't actually uh, let you learn to play music and uh, participate in bands and uh, even compose music, uh, which is one of Gil's dreams. She really wanted to participate in bands with her classmates that at the time were learning just regular music instruments like a guitar, piano, flutes, uh, so uh, after a while, uh, starting to work with Gil and teaching her music theory, uh, Boaz noticed that uh, Gil's ability to control her uh, motorized wheelchair was very uh, accurate. She's totally uh, independent in her uh, motorized wheelchair uh, by the help of uh, joysticks and buttons. So Boaz thought uh, he had a eureka moment and uh, he thought, why don't we create a musical instrument uh, inspired by a guitar, uh, but controlled by sensors and buttons and, and joysticks. Uh, so he came to me and we, uh, he showed me uh, a short video of Gil trying to play different instruments with uh, a lot of frustration, not only frustration of Gil, but also 
of Buzz and, and Gil's family that she really wants to play, but uh, didn't have an appropriate instrument. And I saw this video and it was uh, so moving uh, as a musician myself and as a father of, uh, of uh, two daughters. Uh, so we immediately decided to try to build a, uh, a prototype, uh, some kind of uh, electronic uh, digital device that would enable Gil to learn how to play. Uh, we didn't have much knowledge on uh, different disabilities or abilities or uh, different uh, muscle conditions. So we uh, we got we partnered with uh, uh, Gil's therapists, uh, occupational therapists, and physiotherapists to learn about uh, cerebral palsy and the, and the abilities. And uh, after a, a few months of uh, of uh, hundreds of prototypes that most of them were uh, thrown away, uh, we created the, our first prototype. And I'll just uh, show you a clip of the first proto prototype and uh, uh, this. Uh, with this prototype, Gil actually uh, practiced for uh, a few weeks and uh, really f fulfilled her dreams of uh, performing with her classmates. So uh, this was a really a special moment for us, this concert uh, that we saw Gil playing. Uh, first of all, the, the, her uh, self-esteem and her confidence to perform in front of uh, 200 people, it, was, uh, it blew, us, uh, blew our mind because she was a very shy girl uh, didn't interact with the with the people around her because of her uh, of how she would uh, uh, present herself. But uh, with this instrument and the ability to play, it really boosted her self esteem. And uh, her friends started accepting her and uh, working together in this concert. It was an amazing time. And I could also say from uh, from my personal experience, I play the drums. And when when uh, when I was a, a child, I was very small physically. And being behind the drums really empowered me and uh, let me uh, uh, find my, uh, my, uh, my role in the, in, in, in the, in, with my friends and finding friendships uh, aside from just uh, playing uh, instruments. So uh, the, after uh, this concert, we really uh, understand that we really felt that we have uh, uh, something good happening. And uh, as you probably saw from the, from the concert, the, the instrument is very, it was just a prototype instrument and was very uh, uh, bulkish and with a computer and wires. Uh, so we, we uh, quite uh, uh, immediately after the concert, we decided to, to create a, an inclusive instrument, not only for Gil, but for, uh, I would say, millions of people around the world that want to learn music and participate in uh, musical activities, but uh, they can't find appropriate instruments. So we started um, doing research in different institutions and uh, organizations uh, with, uh, with people from the age of five to, uh, to 90, 
uh, to learn more about uh, disabilities and and what abilities and what movements are uh, uh, are available to be uh, to facilitate playing music. I'll show you some of the prototypes along the way of the research. Hi. Um, yes. Uh, we have just really a few minutes, so I think it will be good if you can share with us, uh, show us uh, the current Arcana. Sure, sure. Sorry. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll just uh, show some, uh, uh, show you the instrument. So we teamed up with an amazing, uh, amazing industrial designer that helped us uh, take all these wires and crude prototype into a, an instrument. This is the instrument uh, we have today. Uh, there's a, there are many uh, accessibility features in it that uh, that can then make the instrument uh, very playable. I'll just show you. Uh, different uh, abilities inside. So it can also be just like the just like the Xbox controller. We have different handles and different switches that can be used, and make it uh, virtually accessible accessible for everyone to play. We have people today in uh, in schools and institutions from age five to age ninety four playing and learning on the instrument. And I'll, uh, I can. Uh, Try to play something for you now. I'll just turn on my uh, speakers. Okay. So it's very easy to play. You can do many chords, but even with one finger, you can do the most complex chords. And uh, if you want me to play your song later, I can play your song. So we took the frustration and the pain of uh, learning a guitar and playing a guitar uh, out of the equation and uh, the entire content of the guitar uh, education system, it's chords, uh, songs or whatever whatever exists already in the internet and in libraries you can use to play with uh, this instrument.